Welcome back to Beyond the Track, the final episode of 2021. Uh, no better person to bring on for the final episode than the Senior Director of Two-Wheel Operations for Feld Motorsports, my friend Dave Prater. Dave, what's going on? I'm great, Daniel. How are you, man? It's, uh, you know, good. it's that time of year. It's that it time is. Of year. I, it, well, if you can see, I, we're that family, okay? We're that family. We were the first ones to put it up. We'll be the last ones to take it down, man. It's Christmas oh, month. Right at the Blair house. Hey, I understand. I'm not, I'm actually that family this year. Typically my wife is like December 26th, that morning we're taking down everything. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, but it's always, you know, over the years I've had to fly out to Anaheim, like sometimes that next day. So she's like, well, you're not leaving all this stuff for me. Like you're going to uh, help me with this. So, so now that you yeah. guys are sharing those responsibilities it stayed up. It stayed up. Well, we were out of town for Christmas, so we didn't get back on the 26th. So, uh, yeah, it'll be, I'm sure it's probably good coming down right now as we speak. Nice. Um, you just mentioned going to Anaheim. I, I want to start with my first question because I, I truly want to know what is left for you to do from now until Anaheim? I mean, are you ready? And are we just, are we just holding our breath ready to go? Or do you still have some things we got to get through, through Christmas, New Year's? Because Dave, like what, 10 days from now, it's, it's like the storm doesn't stop for four months, but this is the last breath. What? What's yeah. left on the plate for you? I don't know. I mean, I think for the most part, like we could race tomorrow. Um, there's just a lot of little loose ends that you're just trying to you know, get all the details as finely tuned as possible. So we could race tomorrow, but we'll just be continuing to fine tune those details um, all the way up until the morning of the 8th. And then the morning of the 8th, ready or not, here it comes. So um where it go but I think it's that way for everyone you know Supercross is such a big ecosystem a large ecosystem of teams and sponsors and promoters producers sanctioning bodies we're all doing the same thing right now we're all just yeah. making sure everything's as finely tuned as it can be leading into it's that. weird it's weird too because like you said we're 10 days away but it feels like it feels like we're already in motion for the first one. You know, the travel plans are booked. Everyone's looking at hotels. I know the track. I saw Instagram tracks being built. Hope you guys are covering a little bit. I don't know if you've seen the weather in SoCal. Yeah. Hey, I always know, we know what it's going to be. Like it could be, it's, I always hear there's a drought going on in SoCal, but every time I'm there, it seems like it's, there's some moisture. So um, no, it's going to be fine. I mean, we're, we're used to it. We're ready for it um the guys are in like you said they they started moving dirt in the 26th the day after christmas so um we're ready to go it's going to be exciting and uh if we need to we'll cover but um i just can't wait i can't wait for that yeah. that first I'm round is too. always exciting uh anaheim one i want to get into that i i, I want to cover a couple of things with uh you your relationship with the manufacturers and teams the sponsors all those kind of things but i do want to pick off off of something that mike said a week ago mike newey uh, you know, for these stadiums, you get in and get out, right? It's a, it's a pretty intense operation. But for Anaheim 1, you have that luxury of getting in early, kind of working out the kinks. I mean, how important is it for that first one to have that time? And not just like Houston last year where we were in. We were, I mean, it's it just Anaheim 1 gives you that ability with the dirt being there on the property. For that first round, how important is it to have a little extra time to kind of go through those things and not be rushed? Because once we get started, it, it's it's 100 mile an hour. And I, I got to imagine this first one feels a little better to be able to ease in a little bit. Yeah, it does. I mean, the, the, the reality of it is we are always rushed because it's back to back with Christmas and New Year's. So depending on where the actual date falls this year, we're we're lucky because it's going, you know, we're pushed back to the eighth, but it's been January 3rd. So we're up yeah. against it. We're up against New Year's. So um, it's always good to have a little extra time for anything, especially something as large as Supercross and trying to get it out and um, on the way and on the road. But uh, Anaheim's nice because it's the stadium staff there almost know the sport as well as we do. So we go <laughs> they've in. Seen, and, they've and, seen a lot of them. <laughs> exactly. They've seen a lot of them. They know exactly what, you know, our um, our strategy is moving in. They know everything um, as well as we do. So it's nice to have those folks who you're not necessarily educating or or bringing up the speed on things. And uh, it gives us the room and the time to, to get what we need done. So I want to weave around the timeline a little bit here, but I do want to stay kind of current right now. You know, I'm starting to prep my notes. I know Bondo, Bondo's been all over it for TV. We're getting 
I mean, the communication has begun where we're all settling on these storylines, but for you, I mean, what do you, what are you intrigued by this year? I mean, I'm sure it's a hundred things, but what, what is it like if, if you were to say, God, just I like the big question that you want to know, what is it for 2022? Like what, what is it? Webb leaving Alden? Is it Eli switching brands I, for you just on a personal level? What, where's what's priority number one of your interest coming into the season? I think it's everything. I think it's those things you mentioned. I mean, Eli um, switching brands, Anderson switching brands, um, Plessinger switching brands. There's so many movement. There's so much movement of top guys. And then to your point, Cooper leaving out. And so how's that going to work out? Um, could be great. Could be uh, not so great. So there's just so many different storylines, man. I try not to focus on one. I used to do that early in my career and I, I was a, uh, pleasantly surprised that typically the ones I focused on um, kind of fade to the background and one that we didn't anticipate coming is the one that uh, that surprises us. So I like to be surprised. I'm going to try to go into it as open-minded as I can be and just see, you know, what's going to happen. I'm, I'm looking forward to see if, if Barsha can win, what, four openers in a row, which is uh, which is amazing. But honestly, if I had to put my money on someone today, it'd be Justin. So, um, yeah, I, uh, who, how can you bet against the guy for the opener at this point? Hey, Hey, so, you know, the op winning the opener McGrath has the record and it might be twice where he won the opener three years in a row. Mm -hmm. Justin has done it now. So if I'm, I think I'm correct on this because we were going over some stats this week, uh, for race day live, but if Justin wins the opener, he would break McGrath's record for the most consecutive opening round victories, which I mean, if you're Justin Barsha and you want to put one on the resume, man, take that from the king. Like that's, there's some incentive to, to getting that record, even though he wants to downplay and say, oh, I'm more focused on the championship. Dude, if you got a chance to take something from Jeremy in the record books, I got to imagine he's shifting gears. He's going to go for it. He has to. Definitely. I mean, these guys, if you've got a chance to win at all, no matter, you know, the middle, one of the middle rounds or the opener, you're going to, that's what you do. That's what these top guys do. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's uh, it's going to be interesting. And and Justin, not only did he do it twice in Anaheim, but then he had to shift gears last year and do it in Houston. So can he come back and do it in Anaheim again? So yeah, I don't know. There's, there's a lot a, of things. There's a lot of there's a lot of twist to that little story yeah. too, with the bike and the fake win last year, which I do want to ask you about. Oh, but yeah. uh, there's a lot riding on it. Yeah, for sure. No pun intended. Okay, so um, from a uh, promoters side again you guys are looking at a 2022 season you got these star athletes that we've been seeing kind of blossom into their roles I do want to talk to you about the Ricky James and Chad days the Ryan days but with this crop of riders from a from a promoter standpoint how do you structure the preview show the the commercials all those kind of things because I feel like we have a lot of stars and even though Webb and Tomac have been the two to win titles most recently I feel like Kenny is still a superstar um, you got these young guys, Chase Sex and AC coming in. So from a promoter standpoint, how do you approach a crop of athletes like this where there's not a standalone star like McGrath or Ricky and James? When you have a group like this, how do you approach promotion uh, with this crop of riders? I think it's, a, I mean, obviously it's a great problem to have. Um, the, the, the one thing that's a challenge is just trying to spread the love and trying to show you know, as many guys as you can and show their personalities and, and show why they're stars um, and building all those stars. In the past, you know, we focused on the McGraths or the Carmichaels or like you said, Chad or James, Ryan and, and uh, Ryan. But um, that's really the challenge, I think, now. But it's a great challenge to have. We've wanted it for years. And now we've got this extremely deep field. And not only are they talented, they've all got personalities. Like that's, that's another thing we've been lacking. So um, I, I really think that's it. It's just the challenge of, of trying to give each rider their due without watering it down too much or being, a, you know, being as a, a broad, but still giving all those guys their due and, and creating superstars out of multiple guys. I mean, there's, there's arguably 10, 12 guys that are true superstars, especially if you go down to the 250 class, um, those guys that are coming up. They're, they're definitely bright, and I think uh, I think we're going to have a great problem for a long time of trying to promote all these guys. When I get, like, on Instagram and I'll scroll through, I get, you know, an ad every once in a while, and it's, like, Supercross Oakland, because obviously I'm thinking that's – I'm the closest to that stadium. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because the ad will have 
Cooper and Roxon battling. It'll have, it has these moments where these stars have done some of their best stuff, like Cooper and Kenny, the drag race at Arlington, um, the Anderson Marvin at Oakland. I, and I'm assuming that's part of this promotion too, is it's Oakland. Yeah. So there's a couple of Oakland moments in there, but it's funny as we get close to the season, you got all these riders, but at the same time, there's the two or three that I feel have earned um, the attention because they've had the results and they've been up there the most. But then you've got these guys I think everyone's intrigued by, like Malcolm Stewart, Dylan Ferrandis, that haven't like broken through to the top yet, but they're just sniffing. They're right on the outside of that bubble. Are you like me where you feel like this year everybody's making moves to join the lead pack? The lead guys are doing well too, but I feel like that lead pack might blow up. And, and I, Dave, I, I, by the end of it, I think it'll all work itself out. But I'd say the first half of the season, there's probably eight or nine guys who believe they could win and should be in that lead group. And I, I have to imagine, like you, I, I, I mean, I'm intrigued by that because I think we have some new people who are like sick of not being the attention guys, the stars, the, hey, it's my turn kind of thing. And for me, that, that's just, that's fireworks and waiting. And I don't think we see that all the time, but I think we have that now. Yeah, no, I agree. I think in the past, and, and you and I have talked about this a little bit um, recently, but I think in the past, people were somewhat, and I hate to say quick, but somewhat quick to fall in line. Like it felt like after round two, three, four, you kind of could predict the finishing order. And I don't think, I don't think these guys um, are willing to settle for that. I don't think they're, you know, Ferrandis is, is happy with a second or third or any of these guys are. And I don't think they're going to um, settle in quickly and be content with a fourth, fifth, even a second place, like I said, and there's a lot of them. So um, I agree. I think the cream always rises to the top. It will. And at the end of the season, we'll see who's the best, but um, it's going to be a battle for a while, if not the entire season, I think with I, more riders I, than typical. I think so too. And, and kind of comparing this to the Jeremy era or then the Ricky Chad James era, did it seem like everyone realized that those guys were the best and then it was a fight for fourth, fifth, and sixth? And now you have guys that, like, you might be the eighth best guy in, this, in the class, but you think you're the top dog. And I don't think we had that in years past because there was guys who would break away and everyone just kind of accepted that they were the guys. But I feel like this period we're in, it's been pretty much since Dungey was done, where I don't think anyone's satisfied not being the best guy. And you're right. I think it works itself out in the season, but it seems like every year it's going deeper. Like Marvin won the second round last round last year in years past guys would settle in and just accept where they're at. But this field, it's, it's like a very ego driven prideful group of riders, maybe because they're all former but, 250 champs or something, but they all like are not accepting the fact that they're not the guy. And I think that's the gift that we have right now. Yeah, no, I agree. Like I said, I don't think anyone is willing to settle. And I don't think they're even, they're not willing to settle at round seven, um, you know, round eight, nine, 10. So um, it's a great thing. Like you have to, I think you have to have that ego or that belief to be one of the best in the world. I know you do. Um, this game is, I would say at this level, 90% mental. Um, and if you're not, if you're not mentally ready, you're not going to win it. So I think, I think we've seen, we've seen guys in the past, obviously Jeremy, but even, you know, when Ricky James and Chad were battling every weekend, they all mentally knew they could win and never settled for second. And now I believe we just have eight, nine, 10 guys. That feel that way. So <laughs> that think that's, the same way. it's a fun thing for us to watch for sure. Yeah, it's good. All right. I want to, um, I want to go into your timeline because again, you're, I mean, you're, you're in a, a, a cool position where you get to oversee so many different parts of what's going on with Supercross, but you didn't start there. You started at a different place. So I want to go there first. Take me to day one um, working for Supercross or in the sport of Supercross. And then th did you see that coming? Was it by chance? Like, I mean, how did, how did day one even happen for you? Um, it's a, it's, it's a funny story, but to go way back. So Graduated from college, um, didn't really know, like so many people didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and someone asked me that age old question, what would you do if you, if the money didn't matter? And I said, I'd probably work in motocross or supercross because that was always a passion of mine growing up. So um, sent my resume in to, at the time it was Pace, um, sent my resume in. Like a in straight up resume? Like, like full like on resume, resume? <laughs> didn't know what he wanted, yep. Wow. There it was. Um, 
they had just hired someone to uh to work super cross the position i i applied for um long story short that didn't work out i just kept bugging them and uh and it all worked out it all uh i i got the job finally in 2000 and uh you know it just i've been blessed ever since for sure Two, 2000 uh came in in a good time i mean i did yeah it was a, it I was mean, a good time weird well weird time though right i mean what, what are you thinking of that time as you get into the sport you're starting to work it and then this crazy transition is happening where you have the king just i mean the gift uh, uh, for this sport i mean for how many years and then you got this dude coming in who's like, nah, it's my turn. I want to be the guy now. Like this transition of power. What was it like for you to jump right in? And that was happening like in those years. It was super cool to watch. It was fun. Um, you know, I was at that point, I was definitely um, more a spectator than, than I am now. But um, it was fun. And it was just, it was, you know, at the time I didn't probably appreciate it as much as I I should have not because I didn't know what was happening it's just like any new job and especially something as large as Supercross I it was there was a lot of stress um you know I wasn't necessarily sitting back and saying oh I get to witness McGrath Carmichael and that change and um you know something arguably one of the largest changes in the sport so um looking back it's there's a lot of fond memories of that time but at in the moment um it was definitely stressful and, and i was just worried about getting dirt in the stadiums uh, so probably didn't enjoy it as much as i wanted it should have so while everyone else is enjoying this crazy transition from the king to the goat you're stressed out full anxiety maybe the corner of your eye watching what's happening but for the most part you're exactly. not getting to I'm, not getting to enjoy it all the way Right. And, you know, anyone, when you start a new career, that's probably, I got, believe me, I am not complaining because I, I was starting a career, like you said, out of the corner of my eye, I got to watch all this unfold and uh, stressed or not, it was an amazing, amazing time. If you can uh, kind of look back now and then kind of parallel that to today, what what's it like working with Ricky now? I mean, Ricky, to me, he's happy, likable, fun, open book. But I don't think he was like that back then. And I'm sure from you, from a promoter standpoint, are like, God, I wish this Ricky Carmichael guy would be more like what he is now. But he, I yeah. know he couldn't be that guy. But what's it like to see him now, knowing that he was what he was then, just not even the same human? It's tough. I think, you know, I mean, that's, that's, we're all, as far as that time frame, Ricky and I were probably living parallel lives just in different ways. So he had the pressure. He was a young kid. He had the pressure of, you know, this big stage and trying to dethrone the king. And I'm sure he was stressed. I know he was stressed. I know the stress, you know, weighs on you. It's it's the same today with with these young guys coming into the sport. So, um, you know, I like I said, I think we were both in the same boat. He was not, um, you know, the Ricky I know today because it was just a different time in his life. And he was dealing with a lot more, uh, a lot more challenge and, and being young and not necessarily knowing how to deal with that. Um, it's tough. And it's, it's something that, that I've over the years had to, you know, you, you accept and you understand that when anyone is new and feels the pressure, it affects people differently. And, and Ricky was great. Don't get me wrong. He was, he was always awesome, but he definitely was not the, the fun loving you just guide you calls you up and and bust your chops um that he is today so yeah um but it, it was fun and uh ricky and i i, I joke with it we've kind of come through this thing together so uh it's been a it's been a fun fun journey yeah you're right timelines end up matching up pretty well like he was i mean obviously he had his 125 years but right when he was like becoming the you know the face of the sport that's right when you got in there yeah. um so as ricky and the Jeremy thing happens. Then all of a sudden, the next thing is this James Stewart guy is coming out of the amateurs, right? And see, I've known James, I mean, my whole life. He's just a couple years younger than me. So I, 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 it's like I knew it was coming from the time he was on 50s. He just rode differently than everybody. Um, but right. from you guys, from your standpoint, what was it like seeing that coming in and knowing that, okay, we got a guy with crazy personality who's dancing, who is fun, and rides the motorcycle different than anyone ever had before. I mean, how do you approach that from a promoter standpoint when you know you've got something great coming in, but at the same time, he has a job to do, but you're trying to get the, the personality out of this emerging superstar. 
I mean, how, how was that for you guys as James kind of enters the picture and joins Ricky in that battle at the top? It was, uh, it, it was interesting. I've talked about this quite a bit with people, but um, it was a different time. Like we didn't necessarily, um, I think everyone had their eye on the amateur amateurs, the top guys coming out. And obviously everyone was paying attention to Loretta's and that type of thing, but there was no Monster Energy Cup. There was no Supercross Futures just the focus, there was no social media. So the focus on amateurs is so much different today than it was back then. And obviously we all knew James was coming. We had all heard, um, I'd seen him at Loretta's ride, but until he actually got on the scene and you see him ride a real super cross track, um, uh, he's probably the first guy and maybe one of the only guys who um, I saw ride for the first time and was just, kind of in awe I couldn't I couldn't believe some of the stuff he was doing and uh <laughs> watching him that first year jumping off landing off the sides of triples and like literally landing on the sides of the track <laughs> off the track and still just keeping it pinned and um he was just always on the edge and always kept it exciting so um it was fun it was fun to see that guy come in and it was fun to see you know his energy and dancing after he won one main events and sprinklers and and all of that so um again just just happy and and blessed to witness witness a guy like that you, you've got these stars of our sport that have been able to break out and do you know the jay leno and all and you know kind of emerge out of the sport and do things um jeremy was great at that travis pastrano was great at that but when james came in did you guys know like this guy he can transcend this sport and get into the mainstream eye. There's people on the outside. They're going to go, who is that? And what is he doing? Did you guys, did you guys know that up front that that was coming? Like, like you said, when you saw him the first time, were you like, okay, this, we, we might have something special here. Yeah, definitely. I think there are guys like that. Like you said, Jeremy, James, Travis, there are guys like that that just before they ever hit a professional supercross or motocross track, you know, they have that it factor. And then there are guys like, you know, Ryan Dungey who came out of nowhere, who, who quickly got to that point, but he just, he didn't come in with all the fanfare. So, um, yeah, I think there's been a handful. I'd say, you know, Jet Lawrence is a guy right now that uh, I think a lot of people see is, is he's that guy that can transcend the sport. Um, and there are others, I'm sure, but Jed is is that guy right now that's standing out um, above the rest. So we'll see, but um, it it depends on what they do with it as well. And it's a uh, it's it's one thing to come in with a lot of promise, but you've got to deliver as well. So uh, we'll see what happens there. And uh, and again, I keep saying it, but it's true. It's just it's truly fun to watch how these these guys progress and how the sport overall progresses. When, when a rider that has that ability to transcend starts, you know, moving on or not moving on, moving out, like Bubba had in Bubba's world, Travis doing his things. How involved is Supercross in those kinds of things as they're happening? Do you guys know about it? Um, is there ability to help out? Because I know like sometimes outside, like Red Bull will even reach out to you guys like for an event or something and ask for assistance on things. Um, how involved are you guys when it comes to getting these riders um, or when they're involved with things outside the sport, is there some involvement there? Yeah, it depends on the rider, of course, and it depends, it depends on their team and their partners and their sponsors around, around every rider. But, um, it really has, it's, it's evolved along with everything else. But, um, you know, I would say 10, 15 years ago, we may not have, have been as involved as we are today, simply because we were, we weren't as, um, we weren't as in concert as we'd like to be. And we weren't necessarily communicating 15 years ago with everyone, race teams, athletes, everything else. So um, today, yes, we're definitely involved, you know, with things that, you know, Jet and his agent Lucas want to do. And um, we want to be involved. We want, if we can, if we can help, help lift those guys up, it only helps the entirety of the sport. So um in any way we, we want to be involved and we want to help in any way that we can to, like I said, lift, lift the entire sport and, and help out. So I, and I've, I obviously started the TV stuff in arena cross came to Supercross about five years ago. So I've seen that side of it now for about five years. And it seems like the relationship between Feld and the teams and manufacturers is really good. 
it seemed like it was pretty good before COVID, but then all of a sudden with this pandemic in Utah, do you feel like that, everyone having to come together to make that work took your guys' relationship to a new level? Because it does seem like you guys are connected with the teams and manufacturers more now than even five years ago. Do you feel like, I mean, is that true? Is that truth to that, that this thing has evolved because of a time of need where now everyone seems to be closer and on the same page? Yeah, I think so. Um, I definitely know we're communicating more um, and that was out of necessity. I think it wasn't necessarily that, you know, we didn't want to communicate or the teams didn't want to communicate, but it's like life and life. You're going hundred miles an hour and you're focused on your area and the team and the writers are focused on their area. And um, if there's any positive, there's a lot of positives, I guess, um, that came out of this unfortunate situation, but um, it really made us all slow down and regroup and, you know, refocus our energy as a collective group rather than, hey, we'll worry about selling tickets and building the racetrack. You guys worry about getting your rider up to speed and, and so on. So um, it definitely opened up the communication. It gave us a chance while we all hated it, we all hated sitting at home and, and waiting to see what was going to happen, you know, at the end of 20 and then in 21, um, it gave us all a chance to kind of breathe and, and do a deep dive into everything as a whole. Um, Cause there are a lot of moving parts in the sport of supercross and motocross. You've got, you know, producer, promoter, um, race teams, athletes, partners outside just industry partners industry companies so um i think that was definitely a blessing is the fact that we we all got to take take a deep breath and sit down and, and communicate and we're trying to continue that communication on um as we hopefully see the light at the end of the tunnel here and as those communications are happening how how influential are the teams uh with ideas or or just their thoughts because i I'm, and i'm just thinking at kind of out loud here but You've got some of the older team managers that have been around for a long time that have seen all these changes over 20, 30 years. Then you've got some of the newer team managers like Tyler Keefe and the guys over at Star. So you have these kind of like different feelings, even from the manufacturers that I'm sure are trying to influence in ways. I mean, how does that communication go with those different groups? And ultimately, I mean, just how does it work out? I'm just curious of how those communications happen when you have probably a lot of ideas all in one setting or one meeting. I mean, how do you guys comb through that stuff? It's, you know, it's, it really is. It's like, it's a group effort and it's, it's great to have these, these collective meetings where we're all together um, because we can share ideas and, you know, someone will throw out an idea and you can see the, the majority of the group kind of rolling their eyes, but it may develop into a fantastic idea. So um, I think the, just the idea that we're all together, that we're sharing ideas that someone who may not you know, sees things the way someone else does, at least gets to hear the other person's perspective and, you know, consider it because um, that wasn't always happening in the past. And so I think that's been great. I think the other um, interesting thing, and, and uh, I guess it's just human nature, but we have these large team meetings and then individually, you know, people will break out. So I'll get calls from people individually. The individual team managers will call each other and discuss things more. So it just keeps the communication open and it keeps people thinking forward and, and being creative because I think there, you know, again, I, 15 years ago, I think there was, um, you know, some complacency as far as just let's, Supercross is, is good. Let's keep it there. But I think, um, you know, over the last five years, and especially due to COVID, um, we've had a lot of a lot of innovation, a lot of innovative ideas come up, and uh, people were willing to try it. So um, it's exciting because I think if if we sit around and we do things the way we've always done, um, we're, we're going to stop growing for sure. It seems to me too that the teams, and, and maybe this is maybe well, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seemed like the teams. I've always been focused on winning because that's their priority. They got to win. But it does seem like that shield, that wall has been coming down where the riders are being more involved in marketing. And like the media days, it seems like the mood even at the media days has changed where I feel like the teams and riders have started to accept that it's more than just winning on Saturday. There's more to this thing for our whole brand, for everyone just to blow the bubble up. Have you seen that too over the last few years where it seems like the teams and the riders 
are more willing to accept that winning is not the only thing that matters to all of us and that we got to be a little bit more open, communicative, um, creative. I, I feel like I've seen that. Is, is that correct? Yeah, no, for sure. I think, I think winning is still the number one thing. Like if you ask any of the OEMs today or any of the top teams, they're going to tell you that's number one. But I think social media has, has really kickstarted that um, because these guys are all showing or the majority are showing their true personality outside and off the racetrack. So that's just carried over into marketing with the OEM, marketing with their their different sponsors. And people understand, like people, it's great to win. Don't get me wrong. And it pays to be a winner. But the reality is people connect with people. So if if my son, who happens to like one rider, and I, and he loves that guy, it's not necessarily because he wins all the time. It's because he loves watching him on TikTok. You know, he loves his personality. So I think that's really been one of the things that's really put it into kind of hyperspeed because it it has changed quickly. Um, it used to be, let's just win. We don't need to do anything else. We don't need to show personality. But uh, people quickly, quickly understood that, that that landscape is changing. And, and we've got these guys, these, and maybe it's due to the fact that these athletes have all grown up in a social media age but they're not afraid to show their personality they're not locked up they're all for the most part pretty loose and uh like to have fun with it i mean you guys supercross is your product right that's that's the product and the brand you've got the television side you've got the live side you've got that social media side all those seem to have been going very well in the last few years but when you look at that product and then you see your athletes, not your athletes, but the athletes like Barsha having BAM TV, um, Cincerello having his blog, and you're like, wow, we're like our athletes are branding themselves out to the masses away with the helmet off with their personalities. Do you just look at that and go, everybody get on board, like everyone do it, you guys all do it, it's working because yeah. to me, it seems like that reaches outside of just the people who want to see racing. They want to see Justin Barsha act like a goofball and see a personality side that they never saw before. So are you guys watching these things going, yes, pedal to the metal, all of you keep doing this because the characters are starting to come out of, out of this product that you guys have. Definitely. I mean, it casts, we want to cast the widest net possible. So as many different tentacles, different athletes that can reach out and, and grab a new audience, the better for everyone, for everyone involved, for that athlete, for the sport as a whole, for their sponsors, um, for everyone. So a hundred percent agree. The more, the more personality, the more, you know, Adam's vlogs and um, Jets TikToks and, uh, and BAM TV, the better. Do you have TikTok? I, I don't have TikTok. Are you, are you watching Jets TikToks? I don't even. I don't even know what it really is. Daniel, the only reason I have TikTok, man, is because I have a twelve-year-old son. So I have to. I'm getting to that, man. I can't believe I just. I'm getting to that age, I guess, that I, now I have social media to make sure I'm monitoring what's going on in my kid's life. But no, I do not. Um, yeah. You have your own. You do, you, do you have watch. your own reels. Do you have your I, own TikTok? I reels? haven't posted on TikTok now, <laughs> and I don't plan on it. Do you ever have to sit the kids down and be like, back in my day, Tom at MySpace had it going on. We really had something special there. But I wasn't even the, the OG. <laughs> no, because I didn't even have MySpace. So, um, but yeah. So you avoided I, I all that. You avoided all this mess. I, I avoided <laughs> all. Instagram has been my only thing that I've, you know, I've uh, gotten sucked into. But no, I definitely, I definitely set them down and, and say back in my day. But I think that's what you, <laughs> you have to do that as a dad, you know. Yeah. It's, it's well, time's crazy. going fast. Things keep changing fast. Back in my day, it was like two years ago. It's oh, like, I, know. I can't even keep up anymore. But and, but I, again, to your point, though, you've got this next generation of jet and I, and I will talk futures here in a second. But this next wave of athlete, the Ryder D. Francesco, the danger boy, they seem to be tapping into this new communication thing that we're all probably trying to figure out like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? Because they got huge audiences over on this TikTok thing where they're just being goofy jet with his dog. And I, I mean, again, it's so different for me and probably for you, but at the same time, they've tapped into maybe the next wave of fan base, like the next 30 years are all coming out of this thing. So it's like, we have to modernize with jet and all these TikTokers. 
Definitely. You have to, you have, to. I mean, that's where everyone's attention is right now. And it's to your point, there are like danger boy and jet and whoever, um, De Francesco, they're all, they're all reaching an audience that may not even know what motocross supercross is, but, but they, they like that personality. They like you know, jets brand or danger boys brand or whatever it may be. And they're going to get introduced to the sport through that. And so I think it's fantastic. And I don't think there's a ceiling on it, to be honest. And I, I think the most important thing is finding that balance. I know you and I have had these conversations about balancing the approach where you have diehard fans that ride, they, they, they read bike reviews. I mean, they are into it on a really technical uh, side of things. But then you have this new audience of these younger kids that are out there that are like, this Jet Lawrence guy is funny. What's he do? Oh, he rides dirt bikes. Oh, that's cool. So there's like this balance of trying to brand Supercross for the diehard customer. And then these new people who are like intrigued, you guys have the broadcast where we have the balance. You have the live show where you got to balance. You have social media where the balance, how hard is it? Or maybe how easy is it to find that balance? Because we are chasing after different customer bases that have different needs and different wants uh, when they're consuming the sport. I think it's a challenge because you have to, to your point, I mean, you, we've got a lot of new fans who may have never ridden a dirt bike um, and you've got to educate them and you want to keep them in the sport and keep them as fans for as long as you can. So um, you want to educate them and, and try to be as basic in some ways as you can um, while also not alien, alienating the core because the core um a lot of them forget they were they were once amateurs too and they didn't know all these things so they've slowly gotten to the place where they are and i understand because some of it does seem a little elementary at times or what we're what we're you know talking about at the live event or what we're what we're uh talking about on the broadcast but it, it's it's really out of necessity to try to educate people on why supercross is such a fantastic sport why it's the best sport in the world and why they should watch why they should be a fan so um and you and i've talked about it like we um that's why i think you're so great at your job because you can do it you can break down a section of the racetrack in a way that the most hardcore fan understands but also my wife who has no no, no <laughs> knowledge outside of myself um of supercross or supercross racing so it, it's it's hard to do um but again i think someone like yourself and that's why you're so good at your job you can do both at the same time well thanks dave i appreciate that i don't know if you know but on the last episode i asked mike mewey for a raise so i this might be the right time for me to ask you for a raise i i go yeah back no mike, mike mike handles all that so he <laughs> <laughs> oh he threw it on to you he threw it on to you so it's one of those all right we'll have he a, did, he did. <laughs> okay well he and i will have a discussion after this uh, yeah. we'll see i'm sure i'm sure you will um but no i to your point on that um you are dealing with different audiences sometimes i feel like football there it's so big that they don't have to really like understand their customer base they just they they know it, it's just working for them where again, you and I have had these discussions where it's like, you got new viewers. Like, how do we get a new viewer to go, God, this is the, this is the best thing I've ever seen. Like, who is that Justin Barsha guy? How do I find him? How do, I want to get a bike for my kid. There's that guy. And then there is the diehard who's watched, who watched Bob Hanna. And mm -hmm. is like, wants to understand why this crop is different than Bob or maybe the same as Bob. And, and I think it's challenging. So my question for you is, because you're overseeing the TV side uh, with Doug and everybody at TV. Then you got Mewy on the live event. Then you've got the social media side. They're all they're these little pockets of your guys' company. Um, how much influence is coming from you and of all them and your guys' discussions in making sure we capitalize on both those opportunities and, and making sure that we find that balance? Because it, it is a hard balance to find when we're searching for new while satisfying current. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do, you, how do you approach that? I wouldn't call it a problem, but that sometimes difficult balance it's it's tough and it's a challenge like we were just talking about but i think that one of the um great things about working for a company like feld is we have some core core people so we have some core people that grew up racing and and are as core as you can be and then we have a lot of people who are just introduced to the sport when they get the job 
So we've got this nice balance and we're able to meet every week and we review, you know, what happened this week. And like you said, whether it's social media, PR, um, during the season, it's the broadcast or the live event, but we review everything and we talk about it. We say, hey, this was a little too endemic. Like if you're not part of the sport, you don't know what was going on. And we have those people who aren't endemic and they are new fans and they're asking questions. So if we know if, if they're asking questions or want a little more, um, you know, explanation, we know we need to give it. And then um, vice versa, we know we've got these core guys that are going, you know, that was a little too dumbed down. So it's, <laughs> yeah. it's always it's always a balance and it's going to continue to be because as long as you're trying to grow the audience and reach a, a non supercross motocross fan, um, you're going to have to do that. You can't be core all the time or you're you're going to slowly, you know, squeeze yourself out. So, um, it, like I said, it's it's. The benefit of being here at Feld and having such a large group of people and such a diverse group of people, um, that helps a lot in, in how we deliver the message. Uh, another question, I guess, when it comes to the relationship between Feld and the manufacturers is the AMA. They're, they're the sanctioning body, kind of the rule book side of this thing. Um, how does that triangle work, too? Are, are, are they, I mean, I know they're included in all these discussions, but is there a lot of push and pull from them with the manufacturers on certain rules with them or even things with you when it comes to the live show and making things work to make the whole thing work? How involved is the AMA in both those relationships? They're really involved. Um, you know, they're, we, we have these, um, they're probably bi-weekly or bi-monthly team meetings. Um, the AMA is involved in, with those. Um, they're involved in really every different aspect because if we want to change something with the, the live event or the, the way the show runs, they need to be involved because, you know, just from the most basic element like timing. So you've got to have enough time. If you don't make the main from your heat race, you got to have enough time to get back and get things ready for the LCQ. And then the LCQ, if you make, if you transfer out of the LCQ, you've got to have enough time um, to make it to the main. So just little basic things like that. If we just uh, decide we're gonna cut two minutes out of the program and, and put this here, it could affect a lot of moving parts. So it's it's definitely, um, there's a lot of communication, a lot of working together and the AMA's right there with every step of yeah, the way. Yeah, I've just seen conversations where, you know, the manufacturers may have, a something that they want in a certain way, but it has to fit with you guys, what you're doing on the promotion side and the event side. It's got to also fit with what they do. And it, it feels like things can be arranged and worked out, but it might not always make sense right away because we got to check with them because they have something going on that might affect that. You know what I mean? It's right. It's there's a like a lot of pieces that man. don't it's, all, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a lot of compromise. Um, they're really, you know, uh, we talked about it earlier, Supercross is this huge entity and it's got a ton of moving parts. And every decision that we make is going to affect, you know, something on the other end and vice versa. So um, just a lot of communication, a lot of, uh, a lot of working together and um, it, it, it all works out, but making a decision um, in a vacuum does not, does not turn out well. Yeah. yeah well, you end up just pissing off the other side because they didn't get to be involved in exactly. the discussion so exactly. and again it seems like it's been way more integrated over the last few years it seems like everybody's pretty tight i mean that's what it feels like even in the pit it seems like everyone's on the same page now um with that in mind let's talk futures because uh, a big part of growing the sport is getting the next generation ready to be superstars futures is coming out this year uh, in a different way. And I understand the reasoning. We, the goal is to get back to having the amateur days and letting all the kids from 50s to vet riders get on the track. But this year we're doing things a little different. This futures model is just the 250A expert group that's trying to transition into Supercross. But to get them on to Saturday night racing in the format that you guys are doing, I have to imagine a lot of ideas to make this work between the manufacturers and their young talent between the AMA who has to make this thing work, between you guys that have to fit it in, how did this all come about where you're going to have these future A kids, the future super uh, stars are getting their feet wet in the program? I mean, I, I, when I heard it was going this way, I was like, wow, this had to have been complicated to make it work. But how did it come about? How was the push and pull for manufacturers, AMA, you guys, 
to do something brand new. This is this is way brand new, Dave. Yeah, no, we're exciting, man. I th- we're excited about it. I think so. Originally, when we started futures, that was part of the plan. We wanted to do the two hundred and fifty futures class on Saturday with with the pros, with the two hundred and fifty and four hundred and fifty class. Um, it didn't necessarily work out work out just because of timing. Like there's so much that we pack into a day um, that it just was a challenge to find that time. But um, with all the COVID protocols we had going on and, and no one needs to be, you know, have a review of that over the last couple of years, we just, it was impossible to do those races on Sunday and continue to test everyone and everything that we were, um, we needed to do uh, that the venues were requiring us to do. So we thought we'd shelve it um, our plan was to bring it back in its entirety in 22, but obviously um, the pandemic has lasted a little longer than we all anticipated, or at least we anticipated. So um, we thought this was a great way to continue with futures, kind of bridge that gap as we move into 23 and get back to Sunday um, 24 class Supercross futures events. So um, it's just, it's something that I think everyone has embraced and going back to really the way the world is now and social media and the fact that these kids are building brands before they turn pro. And it's just another way to, to build their brand outside of social media. Um, so now you can come out, you're at Supercross on Saturday night and you're seeing these guys before they even turn pro. So, you know, we've all, everyone's heard, all the fans have heard about um, Ryder or, uh, vegan or whoever and uh now they get to actually watch them compete um, on saturday night prior to going pro so again just whatever you can do to build the sport build their brands um and, and build the the oems amateur investment um, it's going to only help us all in the long run from the amateur side you have star yamaha i mean obviously i think they got like three or four of them in the pipeline they just they're ready you know you got the husky guys they got evan ferry he's kind of in talent hawkins Honda's got chance time. It seems like the manufacturers are starting to grab these. They always have, but they're grabbing these guys and getting them ready. They're even prepping for Supercross a year early. Were they stoked on this idea and the chance to kind of let their future guy get his feet wet? Like if you're Honda, I have to imagine getting chance Hymas on some Supercross tracks early is a way to almost work out some of the bugs. Were they, were they stoked on this on board with the chance to kind of help develop their guys in a real setting and not, on the futures tracks where before they were mellow where they had to be safer for everybody. Were they on board with this change? Definitely. I think from day one, they were on board with, with their top guys being on Saturday and on a real supercross track, like you said. Um, and, and it just, these guys are exposed to the fans so much earlier anyway now um, that this is just another way to, to expose them even more and expose, like you said, the OEMs and the, the manufacturers, they, they get to now, have two, three, three more years with these guys. Um, and, and they're always, they've always been jockeying for the best guy, but it just seems over the last four or five years, now that the amateur world has blown up so much, um, it, the exposure that they're getting and, and the amount of uh, eyeballs is just way more. And it's become a, much more a priority for the OEMs. I, I have to imagine that it's easier for them to start dissecting which riders might make the leap to pro better than the others i in the years past these kids ride you know outdoor motocross tracks all year they race loretta lens and you're kind of gambling if the guy could be good at supercross or not you don't know really if they've got it until you hire him and then sometimes you find out like that wasn't an easy transition or some you're just like wow that worked do you feel like this new model that again got put away for a little bit's coming back will allow the teams even and the sponsors to have a better idea of who might transition properly into Supercross. Because I feel like sometimes you'll watch a rider ride and it's you don't know for sure if that transition's there. Now you're going to see these kids at 15, 16 years old. You're going to have a better idea if, oh, this guy really understands Supercross and we're starting from a better place. Do you think it'll be better for the teams to be able to pick apart the riders they may want to go and grab because they're seeing them actually on the tracks that they're going to be paid to race on? And there's yeah, going to be less sure. mystery. Definitely. And I think, I mean, how many times have we all heard it? Like this, this guy, even now, like the 450 guys, oh, he's flying at the test track. Well, you can only do so much 
at the test track. You put a kid in a real world race environment with a full stadium. And now again, back to that mental aspect, can you handle all of that? Like you may be fantastic and you may be technically sound and just incredible at the test track and the, from the physical part of riding supercross, but you've got to be able to handle everything else that goes with it. You've got to be hand, able to handle 45,000, 50,000 people in stands, the lights, that, that pressure that we talked about, signing autographs and just the entirety of it. So I think by giving these guys a taste of it on Saturday, um, it definitely gives those OEMs a much better picture of what they're going to be like once they do go pro. It's almost like in like the NFL or NBA, you draft a player and you're like, this guy could be an all pro or he could be a you know rookie contract and out. You never know till they get into the pro league. And I think you're right. It's not just playing the game or riding the motorcycle. It's dealing with the attention, the distractions all day long, the 45,000 screaming. I feel like those factors, you don't really know until you get there. And even in the NFL and NBA, they don't know until the guys get into a regular season where this now seems like we could test these guys out a little bit. And even for some of the ones that maybe are shell-shocked early, four or five future races, they might get over that. And you're like, oh, well, now we know. And it's, I just I feel like it's going to be a better way to understand what's coming instead of having to guess and just watch videos and like, yeah, he looks like he'll be good. And I think to your point, there's going to be some kids out there that are like a dungy that you've never heard of. And all of a sudden you see him on a Saturday night at a futures, you're going to be like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. This, this could be a dungy type guy. And I don't think we would have ever got that before. No, you're right. I think it's, you use the, the example of the NFL. I think now obviously, you know, when it comes to who you're going to draft, if you're an NFL team, who are you going to draft? obviously the best talents typically at the larger universities, the football powerhouses, but a lot of that, a lot of what goes into that is knowing that those kids can handle that, you know, microscope and can handle that pressure of being at a Florida state or Ohio state or Alabama, wherever that is, one of those football powerhouses. Um, so it's just one more tool that the OEMs are going to be able to use. They're going to see this kid in the environment, in the supercross environment, they're not going to have to worry or, you know, wonder, can they handle all that pressure? They're going to see it and at least get a small taste of it. Um, Dave, last question for you before we wrap it up. Um, and you're not, I'm not going to let you say this current era because that's the easy way out. But looking back, say the Ryan era, the, the, the Villapoto Dungy era, the, um, the Jeremy Ricky transition there of power, the James Chad days, when you look back, on a personal level, which era to you just, you know, it just checked the boxes. It was entertaining. It was great for the sport, personal satisfaction. Again, can't use this current era because that's the easy way out, Dave. Before that, though, what, which one stands out to you where you just were like, man, this, this was your most personal, uh, personal fun part uh, of being involved in the sport? They were all good, man. And I know that's what, uh, that's the the politically correct answer but they all were they were all exciting they all had their different things but i would say just for me personally probably the carmichael stewart reed um reed days i think having those three guys at the top of their game and all being there together um all different personalities in a lot of ways similar personalities in other ways and, and just um as they were all so um, involved, if you will. So they were all, you know, calling me on a regular basis and giving input or calling whoever. Um, we walked the track. I tell this story to people, and it's uh, it it only lasted about five rounds because of uh, what happened. <laughs> but but um, I know that I, story again. Somewhat being young and, and naive, I decided that because they were they all had track ideas. And they mostly um, centered around the whoops. And so I decided. What, were the track ideas what was best for the sport? Or was it maybe best for that? Well, individual? I, it depends on who you ask, Daniel. <laughs> but I think it was probably what's best for them. So I, that's actually why, why we quit. So I think it lasted five, maybe six rounds. But after the writers meeting for these five rounds, um, I decided that it'd be a good idea to walk Ricky, Chad, and James around. And they could just give me their input there on the track and uh I started referring to it as the three bears because we would 
we would get to the whoops and one of them would be like these whoops are too big and the other one these whoops are too small and the third one these whoops are just right yes right <laughs> so i quickly <laughs> i quickly learned that uh it was kind of kind of a useless exercise but it was entertaining and it just goes to show you though they were they were extremely engaged in every aspect um obviously their team and, and the motorcycle and all that but their videos their opening ceremonies videos the track uh, everything they were always just ultra competitive and trying to get any advantage they could on the other guy and so that that to me stands out um as one of the most memorable for me i think i think that's i mean I, i'm with you i think all those eras had their what was great about them and then for me that one was i think it was the competitiveness just the the personality traits and i and i love the personalities that we have in the sport right now but even like Plessinger and Malcolm Stewart, as fun, as cool as they are, they're pretty gnarly when the helmet comes on. And I feel like, again, we're, we're dealing with a, an era that's like that era. There's just more of them. So it's a little confusing over the pecking order. But I kind of feel like the eight to ten guys we're talking about that think they can win have that same mentality that that group had. There's just more of them, which makes it hard to figure out. I, but, but I feel like we're, I'm feeling the same vibes once the helmets are on that those guys had were super competitive. I agree. I agree. I think the only thing that's different today, and it may change after they hear me say this, but they were ultra competitive in every aspect. Like they wanted to have a better opening ceremonies video than the other guy, or they wanted to get in the, in the other guy's head with their opening ceremonies video. And they weren't shy about letting you know that. So um, that, that was the thing that really, you know, set them apart, but you're right on the track. I think those eight to 10 guys now are just as competitive and, and cutthroat as Ricky and Chad and James were in their heyday. Hey, it's what, 10 days away. We get to 10 days to away again. Yeah. Awesome. Here we go. Uh, yep. Dave, thanks for coming on. Uh, enjoy the last breath. This is the last breath because you know, pretty much next week it's, there's no breathing anymore. It's no. just wide open. It's bouncing around. You just got to be prepared. So I, I'm enjoying my last breath here. I know you're doing it there as well. I hope to see you here in about a week. And here we go. Sounds good, Daniel. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'll see you in a few days. It's going to be fun.